I hope you've embraced the words of that song and realized for yourself everything Jesus Christ has done and is doing in your lives. And that your lives become lifted hands to God. Lifted so that the world might see what he is doing in you and might be drawn to him. That's our call. Today's message is the third message in the series, He Still Speaks. See, there are seven miracles in the book of John. John said, I have written these things to you, these signs. I've shown you these signs. So that you might believe in the name of Jesus Christ. And that by believing, that by believing, you might have eternal life. See, the miracles are there to point us to Jesus. And the problem is, oftentimes in our lives, we start to think, well, I don't see any miracles, so maybe Jesus isn't working in my life. Maybe Jesus doesn't care. And this series is here to show you that He still speaks to you today. That there are still signs and wonders in you and through you that testify that God is not just alive, but He is active, cares about what's going on in your life. Amen. Today's message is entitled, well, I'll tell you the title in just a bit, but it's found in the book of John, the fifth chapter, and we're going to be reading verses 1 through 18. One of the awesome things about these miracles and signs is that Jesus brings them each to a different type of person. Last week, uh, we talked about how he came to a nobleman, a ruler, uh, someone who had a lot of power, and Jesus Christ did miraculous things uh, for him. And all the people were amazed, uh, even though they didn't see the miracle, they know he did something for someone who was important, and they liked that. This next miracle is for someone who's just the opposite. See, in Jewish culture and society, they didn't have hospitals because the sick were burdened. They had some doctors to help you get well. But ultimately, sick were placed on the side. They were the ones who became the most homeless. Nothing like our culture. But, 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 but they were the, the, the least cared for in society. They had to band together and try and help each other out. And there we find a story of a man who had been an invalid for most of his life. He had tried everything to get better. Went to the doctors, tried to pay the priest to pay for him, uh, used up all that he had to try and find a remedy for his sickness. And when he was desperate, desperate, he went to a place of superstition. It's amazing the things that we will try when we're desperate. The things that really can't help us, but give us the illusion that they can. That's another sermon. I'm not going to get into that guy. Kind of but, you know, just work on that for yourself. He heard about a pool that when the waters would bubble, it was a sign that an angel had come down and stirred the waters. And the first one to get there, he would be healed. It was like God's own like uh, personalized test, right? His, uh, you know, uh, like, holy moly. Anybody here watch holy moly? Yeah. The golf show where they try and give everybody confessions. The great show. Anyway, <laughs> like, this, is, this, this is what you know, I, some people see God was like. You know, maybe some people still today think God's like. You know, if I just do the right thing in the right way, the quickest and I'm the bestest, goodest person there ever was, then I'll be blessed before you. And so what would happen is the water would boil up and the people would start pushing and shoving and biting and, and so that they could be the first to get the water because if they could get the water first, then they could get the prize and healed and their wishes fulfilled. It would be awesome. They would hire people to help them in the water, bring family to help them. It was this big contest. But this man had no one. His infirmity was bad enough that he could not get there fast enough. And you think he'd give up after the first six months, maybe the first year. But he had nowhere else to go. He was desperate. And so for 38 years, he lay in this place of superstition, trapped by his body 
and trapped by his superstitions. But then one day, as he's sitting there, in the midst of his hopelessness, a shadow passes before him. And someone asks a similar question. That's where we find ourselves in John the fifth chapter. Starting in verse 1, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now some there in Jerusalem were near the Sheep Gate, a pool which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great multitude of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there who had been impotent. For 38 years, Jesus saw him lying there, learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, and asked him, and asked him, do you want to get well? Look at the answer. Sir, I have no one to help me into the pool. When the water is stirred, when, when I'm trying to get down there, somebody goes ahead and gets in ahead of me. Then Jesus answered, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Now, if this had been anybody but Jesus, this would have been a cruel declaration. But when Jesus calls us to do something, no matter how unrealistic, or how weird, or how crazy it seems, He empowers us to do the thing He's called us to do. Can I get an amen on that? <laughs> At once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. The day that this took place was on the Sabbath. Someone should say, Praise God, because the Sabbath is a day of blessings. Someone should be like, Hallelujah, this is great. However, so the Jews said to the man, Who healed you? It is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. The man replied, the man who made me well said, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick up your mat and walk? But the man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you were made well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. So the man went away and told the Jews, it was Jesus. Who made him well. So because Jesus was doing these things, what are these things? Healing people, setting them free. Because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him all the more. Father in heaven, we have come today bringing our infirmities to you. Our which is to answer your question, do we want to be made whole? And the answer is yes. And so, Lord, we ask that you pour your spirit down upon this place, that you would fill us, make us whole, so that we might proclaim your name the way it should be. Thank you, Father. God has sent this message, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you ever felt impotent or imprisoned in your life? with none of your dreams coming true, feeling alone in your suffering. I've got news for you. Jesus is dead. There's a story about my cousin Maynard. Have I ever told you guys about my cousin Maynard? He's a Portuguese from up country Maui. And he was visiting his brother in prison. His brother got some, some, some problems and got to go to prison for a while. And after visiting him, uh, Maynard was frustrated and incensed. So he went to the prison guard and said, hey, you gotta lay off my brother, okay? Stop working so hard. He's a good guy. You know, you're gonna kill him if you keep working so hard. And the prison guard said, hey, buddy, no. Uh, all your brother does is sleep and eat. Whenever I see him, he's not working that hard. Mayor goes, what are you talking about? He's told me he's been building a tunnel for months now. <laughs> he said, sometimes what you think you need, what you think is gonna help, is actually, is actually something that's just gonna hurt you. Three things from this uh, message today. The first is how important is your want? How important is your want? The second is don't let others steal your miracle. And finally, finally, share your revelation.
How important does you want? The man wanted to get into that pool. Okay? He wanted somebody to help him. That was the focus of his want. That was his desire and passion for 38 years. Could you imagine that? 38 years focused on this one thing, getting into that pool first. But Jesus didn't ask him if he wanted to get into the pool. Jesus asked him, do you want to be made whole? Didn't offer the man what he wanted. He offered him what he needed. What is your want in your life? And how important is that want to you? Do you want the miracle that Jesus is offering you to be made whole? Or is it something else? Is it the thing that you think you need? All the man could see was that he had no one to help him in the pool. The first thing Jesus says is, hey, do you want to be made whole? And the man says, I have no man to help me. How many of you have a man problem in your life? Or a person problem in your life? Be careful how I phrase that. You know, when, 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 when things start going wrong, when you feel like you're not progressing, when you feel like your life has become impotent, you start looking around and say, clearly, clearly, I'm not getting ahead because I have not the help that I need. You know, my marriage would just be better if my spouse would just help around the house. My job would be so much better if my boss could see all the hard work I'm doing and give me that promotion. You know, my church life would be all the more better if they would just stop doing what they're doing. The country would be so much better if there were only my guy in office. How many of you have a person problem in your life? Thinking, believing that if you just had the right individual, if somebody else would do the thing for you that you need to get done, then, then you can move forward. But what does Jesus say to the man? What does Jesus say to the man? Get up. You, get up. Take up your mat and walk. See, Jesus empowered him to do the thing in his life that needed to get done. He didn't call somebody. He could call all 12 of his disciples and say, each of you grab a corner and we're going to run this man into the pool. But what's the man problem that the man had? It was a Jesus problem. He didn't understand the power of him who was standing in front of him. Jesus Christ has given you, and I know this is hard for some of you to hear, Jesus Christ has given you everything you need to be blessed, to walk in the miracle of the life He has called you to. He has given it to you and all you have to do is for yourself stand up and walk the path that Jesus is calling you on. But yet we still complain, we have no man. Here's the thing that they don't want to tell you in commercials. There is nothing in this world that will make you whole. Nothing. Not even a better marriage. Not even a better job. Not even better health. Whatever it is, fill in the blank here. If I just had X, life would be good. For some of you, it's actually a man. Pastor, if I just had a man in my life, I've been single for so long, I just want somebody. They won't make you whole. There's only one thing that can make you whole. It's Jesus. Amen. Jesus. Somebody say Jesus. He had put all his hopes and dreams in the pool, but had to abandon that idea to receive what Jesus offered him. What dream, what dream do you have to abandon in your life in order to receive the miracle that God is trying to give you? Maybe a dream of a certain type of career. Maybe a dream of a certain uh, status in life, owning a home. 
traveling the world in a certain way. I don't know what it is, but there is there a dream in your life that you have fixated on that you're going to have to abandon in order to get to what God is offering you, which is so much more. What's your proof of Bethesda, church? Isaiah 65, 24 says this, Before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. I will hear. See, God knows what we need before we even answer. I love that. Says, before they call, I will answer. You see, it's, oh, Lord, I need help. Give the walk. No, I was going to ask for a man for the pool. I was going to ask for a better job. I was going to ask for the... You don't need to ask. I'm telling you what you need. You got it. Will you embrace it? Will you accept it? Will you run with it? When you do, your life truly opens up. I remember when um, I was a pure vegetarian. Like, you know, God intended us all to be. <laughs> and um, every year we would have a brother from Alaska who was a professional fisherman. And he would come and he would bring salmon. And it was uh, dried and candy, um, little salmon dips. And he'd come to church. And all of the, you know, less good Adventists, <laughs> you know who they are. Every time he'd walk up to the church, they'd scurry over with, oh, hey, hey, hi, James, how you doing? So good to see you. Hoping that he would dole out some of that canned salmon that just took in. Yeah. See, I know what I want. I want some good tofu. That's delicious. But one day, church, one day someone put one of those pieces in my mouth and the heavens opened up. And see, what I thought I didn't want was exactly what I needed. And life has been happy ever since. It's like that with Jesus, isn't it? We keep turning our nose up at the thing that is when we finally embrace it, so delicious for us. Amen. So delicious for us. There's only one way that we can be made whole. His name is Jesus. By the way, the title of my message is His name is Jesus. Number two, don't let others down from your miracle. See, the man had been healed from his impotence after uh, impotence, after 38 years. 38 years. It's older than a lot of you in this church. It's longer than most of you have had jobs. 38 years he had been healed. But the good church people didn't celebrate the miracle. You would think that they would all get together and say, Brother, you haven't been able to come to church in 38 years. Come on down. Let's have a party. But instead, all they saw in the person walking was that he was not living up to the rules that they had for him. And so they tried to steal his miracle. Tried to take away the joy that he had in what God had done in his life. Has that ever happened to you, church? Have you ever run into someone in the church who cares more about their rules than what God is doing, has done, and will continue to do in your life? Too many allow others to determine their joy in the Lord. Too many allow others to determine whether or not they will walk out the miracle that God has given them. Some of you, it's acceptance from parents. And I get that's powerful, right? That's powerful. If mama or dada would just accept me, would just let me know that they were proud of me, then, then I could have joy. Brothers and sisters, they may never, because they can't find it in themselves. Too many times I've seen people come to the church full of the joy that God has for them, excited, jumping up and down with, 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 with glee because God has transformed their lives. 
Do you remember it, church? Do you remember the day of your baptism? I hope it was a great day. I hope you were so uh, full of the Holy Spirit that he burst forth from your being and shone to all those around you. But the sad thing is, way too many times, within a couple months, that joy and beamingness of, over the miracle that God had just wrought in your life turns to gloom and despair. Because people come to you, well-intentioned, saints of the church, and say, oh, it's so glad that you've been baptized. Now make sure that you become a vegetarian. Oh, you know, honey, I saw you in Safeway last week, and you really should be drinking the Coca-Cola. It's the devil's brand, don't you know? You know, honey, here's the thing. I know you accepted Jesus, but when you really accept Jesus, you won't be wearing those earrings anymore. The hem of your dress will be just a bit lower. You'll start to wear a suit to church. Like I said, I'm a really good at this. <laughs> and they look at the way you dress, the way you eat, the way you worship, and they try and steal your joy. We had last week, was it last week? Last week, two weeks ago, two weeks ago. One of the great expressions of worship in this house. We had our own hula halal. Our beautiful ladies get up front and glorify God. As the Bible has told us to do in the dance. But there are people, luckily not in this church, but there are some churches where that's not allowed. Because heaven forbid. Because somewhere somebody made up a rule about expressing praise to God with anything other than your mouth. And then only softly and monotonally. Unless you praise God like a white person, you're not really praising God, are you? Here's the thing. They're not the biggest problem. I mean, they're frustrated. They're irritated. But the biggest problem are when we allow them to get at us. When we allow them to steal our joy. See, who performed the miracle in your life that set you free and made you a new person? Who was it? Somebody tell me. Jesus. I can't hear you. Somebody tell me. Jesus. Who? Jesus. Jesus did it. And if Jesus gave you the miracle, who can take it from you? Nobody. Nobody. So why let them? I don't care how grumpy they look, how furrowed their brow gets, how uh, disapproving they shake their heads. If Jesus gave it to you, they can go sit on a rock. Don't let others steal your miracle. Jesus gave it to you. And sometimes it's just got to be you and Jesus dancing alone in your own house, and that's okay. I love when I come to church when the band is playing every, and you have one of the ladies that are raising their hands and stuff like that. Nobody else in church is raising their hands. Some people are looking at her like, why don't you there raise their hands? It's kind of crazy. They say the hand raising church, but she don't care. Amen. She don't care. She's in the presence of her God, and the only two people that matter in that moment are her and her Jesus. Amen. And that's how she's praising God. Don't let anyone steal your joy. They will try. This church was built on people who wouldn't let people steal their joy. Unfortunately, it got co-opted by people who thought it was their only mission to steal our joy. Don't let it happen. And by this church, I mean Kanyo, I mean the faith. Happened in Paul's day. Oh, you accepted Jesus? Great, but have you been circumcised? No wonderful way to welcome some of the church. Oh no, yeah, yeah, Jesus is good and all that cross stuff, that's nice. But come, I got a knife. I want to show you something. This will be really getting close to God. Imagine that. It's still happening. People are trying to snip off little pieces of your joy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Don't you dare let them. John 14 1 says this. 
Do not let your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. If Jesus Christ did it, believe in him and hold on to that joy. Now, 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 quickly, I got into this real quick. But but maybe you've been that person. Maybe the joy uh, that you once had got stolen by someone else and you felt that you have to steal the joy too. So focused on what others are doing or what you feel they should be doing that you miss seeing the miracle that God is doing in their lives. That kind of critical eye will cause you to miss out on what Jesus is trying to do in you. You cannot see Jesus acting if you're looking at other people. You can't. You have to take your eyes off the world, off others, and what they're not doing, and place them onto Jesus and look at what he is doing. If you've been feeling a little bereft of seeing the miracles of God in your life, ask yourself, what am I critical of? And maybe you find yourself critical at other people's relationship with God, other people's worship of God. Maybe, just maybe. That's why you're not seeing the miracles in your life. It's not too late, though, to rise from the impotence of your self righteousness and embrace the miracle of the one who called you to walk in righteousness, to walk in mercy, to walk in joy. And that one, his name is Jesus. Yes. Finally, share the revelation. Share the revelation. The man didn't even know who healed him, only that he was healed. The revelation is that it was Jesus. Okay, And that revelation came while he was at the church. Think about that. The revelation came while he was at the church. And what his revelation did was cause him to live his life differently and cause others to know the name of Jesus. That's what sharing our revelation does. How many times has Jesus Christ done a miracle for you and you didn't even know he was there? And it wasn't until some later time when you were uh, worshiping uh, before God and praying that came to your head and said, oh my, oh my. God, God performed a miracle in my life. You know, sometimes we go through life willy-nilly, not realizing, not taking account of what God has done. We talked about this a bit last week. But one of the things church does, the gathering together of one another does, because once again, the building's not the church, we are the church. Gathering together as part of the church culture. One of the things gathering together and praising God together does is it opens our minds to what God has been doing in our life. It lets us know that God is working personally within us. There's something about corporate worship that touches us on a personal level if we let it. I'm calling you today to, as you praise the name of the Lord, recognize those places He's been touching you in your life and allow him to touch you in mighty and powerful ways. The man went to the church after the miracle to understand his miracle and thank God. But here's the thing that blows me away. He went to the very place where the people were pointing at him and saying, you shouldn't be walking with your bed outside. Don't you know you're breaking our rules? Why are you drinking coffee and not post them? That's an old Adventist thing, don't worry about it. Why, why, why are you eating chocolate, not carrot? Why are you, why are you, why are you? He went into that place, a place filled with critical, unloving people. But you know who was else in that place? Jesus was. God was. And, and, and this is huge. And this is huge. You need to hold on to this. This is huge. While there were a lot of critical stinkers, Pharisees and Sadducees and teachers of the law and just downright mean, ugly people, yeah, they were all there. There are also people who desperately need to know Jesus. There are also people who, like that man, had felt unworthy, had felt trapped in their own frustration, in their own anger, trapped. In their superstitions, trapped with 
without knowing who Jesus was. They were coming to church and they were feeling, listen, I will never be like these people. I'll never wear enough suits or eat enough right things. Or praise God the right way to be able to be perfect. I guess God can't help me. And that man's testimony is that God has come and his name is Jesus. And he's come to touch your lives in spite of what you thought wasn't good enough. The awesome thing about God is that he comes not to the perfect, but he comes to sinners. And he calls us on. That's the revelation that we get. And that's the revelation that we need to share. See, who can save us from our sins? Who can make our infirmities whole again? Who can empower us and do miracles through us? Brothers and sisters, I've got news for you. His name is Jesus. Carlos, do you mind playing the song? Amen. It gives greater effect. <laughs> I read a sweet story recently about Helen Keller. And you know the story of Helen Keller. She was born unable to see, unable to speak, really couldn't hear. Oh, she could see, but she couldn't hear or speak. And she had to learn sign language and touch. Uh, it was rough life. Rough life. And her teacher, Sullivan, came and she taught her how to experience life. What a tree was, what the sunshine felt like on her face, what the breeze felt like. To experience that even though she was crippled and infirm, she had a whole life to be thankful for, to praise God for, and opened up Helen Keller. And one day after she had taught her all these things and the signs for you know the sun and the breeze and the trees and the flowers and how they smell, all that kind of stuff, she taught her the sign for God. And Helen Keller signed back and said, Thank you so much. I always knew there was someone who loved me and gave these things to me. Now I know who it is. As you realize the blessings that you have in your life and the miracle that God is living in you day after day after day, you realize whose name it is that gives you all these things. Say it with me. His name Give thanks to the Lord. Call on His name. Make Him known among the nations what He has done for you. Sing Him a song of praise. Tell of His wonderful acts. Glory in His holy name and let your heart rejoice. Especially those who seek the Lord. For those who are seeking God today, I've got a name for you that will bring you into his presence. His name is Jesus. Let's list the name of Jesus on high. Lord, I live. 
Lord, we come today to lift your name on high. In the name of Jesus, every heart should be saved. Lord, let us today realize that what we think we need is nothing compared to what you are offering us. And to embrace your call in our lives to live and walk in you. Lord, let no one steal our joy and let us share what you have done with us, with the world around us. This is our prayer, Father. We thank you for hearing it. We thank you for answering it. Lord, I know there's someone here today who is feeling empty, who's feeling challenged, who's feeling like you're not listening to them. Lord, I ask that you would reveal your mercy and grace and love to them in a very real way this week and cause them to walk 